Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. We just wanted to sing a song by Lauren Daigold called Trust in You. Uh, may God bless you through this song. Um, amen. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I've tried to win this war, I confess. My hands are weary. to you. I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing else. Don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher. Your plans are always good. There's not a place where I'll go. You've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could have walked through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, I was listening to a sermon not too long ago, actually, with my wife uh, by Francis Chan. And he said something so uh, simple, but it was so powerful. And it really got me, it really got me thinking. You know, he was talking about how we as uh, Christians, how we as people shouldn't um, just believe something someone tells us, especially when it is in regards to our faith. Um, but how we as Christians, we should, we should search the Scripture, we should study the Scripture, because ultimately, I mean, our eternity depends from, from Scripture, right? And often people, like nowadays, will say, well, I don't believe in hell because God's not that kind of God, or I don't believe in punishment because God's not that kind of punishment, and so many people are deceived. And I just want to, um, this has nothing to do with my sermon, I just want to pass this along to all of you. Um, friends, let's just remember that, I mean, our entire eternity, not just 10 years or 20 years or 50 years, but our entire eternity depends from, from what this book says, from what's written, uh, God-inspired, you know, in this book. And may God uh, give each one of us the, the motivation, may he give each one of us this inspiration, uh, maybe when we come home from this youth service or a week from now or a month from now, that we, maybe if you forget everything that was said tonight at this sermon that, or, you know, during this service, you would this would always stick with you, just, just in the back of your mind, understanding and knowing that your eternity and my eternity, it depends from, from what's written in this book. And it's so important that we uh, study this book, and it's so important that we 
live according to it. Uh, for those of you who have your Bibles, I would ask you to open your Bibles. We're going to stay in Luke the entire time. Uh, we're going to look um, at a specific passage that Jesus told his disciples. This is Luke chapter 14, and we're going to read from verse 25 down to 34. Luke chapter 14 from verses 25 down to 34. And the topic of a message is the cost of discipleship. You know, one thing I noticed is uh, we as people, we uh, are so influenced by crowds. We are so influenced uh, by majority. Uh, let's just give a simple example. Let's say um, tonight, like just play along with the, for me for a second. Close your eyes for a second and just try to imagine this. Let's say we're sitting here at this youth service and you look to the left, you look to the right, you look in front and behind you and this entire, entire place is filled with youth. I mean, automatically, friends, automatically we're going to, we're going to feel more alive. Automatically, we're going to feel like, wow, this youth service is more energetic. It's more lively. It's more God-inspired. We as people, uh, we cannot help, but we are so influenced by, by others, and we are so influenced by crowds and multitudes. And, you know, when I think about this, uh, what I love about Jesus is his reaction is just completely different than what our reaction is. Uh, so let's jump into Scripture. Look what it says, Luke chapter 14, verse 25. It says, Now great multitudes went with Jesus. And he turned aside and said to them, let's stay just right here. So let's think about what's happening. Uh, we read in the beginning of the gospel that Jesus Christ, he comes out to ministry, right, at 30 years old. And um, at first, he has a lot of skeptics. A lot of people don't even know about him. I mean, Jesus Christ was this poor boy that grew up in, you know, the house of a poor man and a poor woman. And he's a carpenter to make a living. He helps his dad and mom and so on. And here he grows up and he's not really known. People don't really know who he is and um, he goes around teaching, preaching in ministry, healing people, casting out demons and time goes by. Maybe years, maybe a year, maybe two years go by. We don't know exactly but a certain amount of time has went by and now we see this uh, image or we see the situation, we see this you know, portrayed in the gospel that great multitudes are trying to follow Jesus. It's no longer, you know, one or two people are saying, God, I'm going to be uh, faithful to you. It's no longer just the 12 disciples that are trying to follow Jesus because, you know, he changed their lives and they want to live according to the way he teaches and so on. But now there's these crowds, there's these multitude, and it's like, Jesus, this is your chance. I mean, this is your time. This is your opportunity. Just, just make an altar call and just have all these people repent and lay your hands on them and they all become converts and disciples and so on. And I mean, this is your opportunity, right? And now, let's, say what, let's see what Jesus says to these people in this passage. Look at verse 26, the very first thing he says to these people that want to follow him. He says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You know, the first time I read this passage, I was thinking to myself, like, what does this have to do with anything? What does this have to do with the story? What does this have to do with people trying to follow Jesus and the rest of the context? I thought that this, play, this verse was just put out of context. For some reason, Luke just wrote it in because he didn't know what else to write. But as I was studying the scripture and I was dwelling upon it, it came to me that this is actually a very important point. Uh, now, I want us to understand, friends, uh, at this time... Um, Jesus, in his situation, he was a rabbi. Uh, Jesus wasn't the only rabbi. There were a lot of rabbis. Rabbis were like these Jewish teachers who had their disciples that were around them, and they would walk around and teach them some kind of wisdom, some kind of way of life, uh, something about God, uh, something about reaching God, attaining God, and so on. And Jesus Christ, he was one of these people. He was a rabbi, and he had his 12 disciples whom he chose. And uh, rabbis, they often used this literary device called hyperbole. Hyperbole was a literary device which was literally an over-exaggerated statement to prove a point. It wasn't literal, but it was an over-exaggerated statement to prove a point. There's many passages in the Bible where it's literal, word for word, sentence for sentence, but there's some places in the Bible, some expressions such as this one, which are hyperbole, they're not literal. So when Jesus Christ says, you know, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, you got to hate your mom and dad, he's not, that's not literal, friends. He's not saying you got to hate your mom and dad, you got to hate your wife, you got to hate yourself, you got to think about suicide. No, we know that the Bible doesn't... Uh, portray this. The Bible doesn't talk about this. So what is he trying to say in this passage? That if you want to be my disciple, you got to hate all these people. you got to hate all these relationships. 
Uh, what he's saying is, I ought to be number one in your life. What he's saying is, I ought to be superior above all your other relationships in life. He's saying, uh, you ought to love me more than you love your wife. He's saying, you ought to care about me more than you care about your children. He says, you ought to be interested in me more than you're interested in your own interests, in your own plans, and, and what you have for your life. He's saying, if you want to be my disciple, you, I have to be so superior in your life. I have to be so high above every other relationship. Only, that, <clears throat> only then can you truly be my disciple. If not, he says, you cannot be my disciple. Now, jumping down. Uh, we can read verse 27. It says, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Friends, a lot of times um, our people, are, are just our Slavics, we, um, we misinterpret this passage. We think that a cross is, carrying your cross is when, you know, someone in church has some kind of sickness for a long time and they're carrying their cross. Or it's when something happens maybe in a family, like a car accident, and they have to, you know, deal with this kind of cross. But friends, when Jesus Christ was talking about cross in this situation to this Jewish audience, everyone knew what he was talking about. At this time, uh, Israel was under Rome. Uh, Rome uh, the Romans were controlling Israel. And what the Romans would do, uh, every time somebody from Israel, every time some kind of, uh, some kind of rebellious leader would try to rebel against, against Rome and so on, they, what they would do is they would crucify that person on a cross. And sometimes they crucified not those kind of people not on hills like they crucified Jesus, but they would crucify them on walkways where people would walk to the supermarkets and where people would walk down the streets to go to different cities and so on. And when the people, these Jews, were walking by, they saw this cross and someone just uh, crucified on this cross. Every person knew this is a person who had some kind of rebellion. This is a person who's tried uh, saying no to Rome, who tried having some kind of revolution against Rome. And friends, at that time, cross meant death. Friends, at that time, cross meant death. And when Jesus says, if you want to follow me, when Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you got to be ready to carry your cross, he was talking about death. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, you ought to be devoted to me to the point of death. He's saying, uh, your devotion to me, uh, your discipleship, uh, your love for me, your, your compassion for me, your desire for me, everything. If you want to be a follower, if you want to follow me, he says, you have to be ready to follow me unto death. You have to be ready for this. And for us, this might seem kind of extreme, but friends, understand the situation that these Jews are living in. So, um, you know, here in America, people believe in Buddhism, Hinduism, um, uh, atheism, you know, God and all these other religions and so on, you know, whatever, whatever fits their lifestyle, they believe in it. But at this time, there was one belief. In Israel, there was one belief. It was Judaism. I mean, everybody believed in Judaism. Uh, their entire nation was built on the principle of Judaism. And here comes Jesus Christ preaching a gospel. Here comes Jesus Christ preaching something that uh, people aren't used to. And to say, I believe in Jesus, to say that I want to belong to Jesus, I want to pledge my allegiance to Jesus, means you're going against the entire system of Judaism. You're going against the religious leaders. You're going against the priests. You're going against the Pharisees. You're going against the scribes, the Sadducees. You're going against the entire religious system. Not only that, but you're going against the entire uh, culture of the nation. I mean, it was to stick out like a sore thumb uh, you know, in a nation. And a lot of times when people would pledge their allegiance to Christ, they were rejected by their families. That's why Jesus said, you ought to love me more. A lot of times when people would accept Jesus Christ, they would be excommunicated from the temples. They couldn't go, they couldn't go there anymore, and so on. And Jesus Christ wanted these disciples to understand. He wanted them to know, if you want to follow me, you've got to be ready to give up your life. I mean, think about it. Like now, you know, there's all these mega churches in America, and they have all these thousands and thousands of people. I, or I wonder what, I wonder how they would react to a message like this. That's so offending. That's so direct. Where Jesus Christ would get up and he's like, "Listen, if you're not ready to hate your father and mother and so on, you can't follow me. And if you're not ready to die, if you're not ready to take up your own cross and follow me to that point, be devoted to that point, I don't even want you as a follower." I wonder how many people would stay in that kind of church. I wonder how many people would heed that kind of message. But that's the kind of message that Jesus Christ, he was preaching. Uh, in Acts chapter 14, we have this story where Apostle Paul, he's preaching in a city. Uh, he ends up healing a crippled man by God's power. And Jews come from a different town where he preached before. And the Bible, the Bible says that they stirred up the crowd. They end up stoning Paul. And they drag him out of a city. They think he's dead. Uh, the next day, the disciples come up to see if Paul's, you know, if he's okay. He gets up. 
takes the dust off his clothes, gets up and just goes preaches to another city. It was like, it was like, what's the big deal? I'm preaching the gospel. I got stoned. Praise the Lord. Next city. I mean, friends, this was normal. Friends, this was normal at that time to be a Christian was to be devoted unto death, saying, I don't care. I'm going to preach the gospel and be faithful. I'm going to go against the crowd. I'm going to go against the culture. I'm going to be devoted to God. And this is something that Jesus wants from us as followers as well. Now let's uh, continue in this passage and uh, let's read from verses 28 down to verse 30. It says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down and count the cost, whether he is able to finish it, lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who will see it begin to mock, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. Here, uh, Jesus Christ is using an analogy of a foolish builder. And he's saying that a foolish builder can be compared to a foolish Christian. Um, now, friends, right now what I'm about to say, this is my opinion. Uh, this maybe is not biblical, but this is my opinion. So you can put it under a question mark and do your own research. And I know maybe some people uh, will not agree with this, but that's great. I, I want you to not agree. I want you to do your research and think about it yourselves. Um, there's, I question a lot of things that um, happen today in evangelical churches. And one thing that happens very often and is very popular is what's called the sinner's prayer where if you basically follow a prayer that says, you know, Jesus, forgive my sins, I believe in you, and so on, you're going to be saved. And um, people believe that if you said this prayer, that you're going to be saved no matter what, because you said this prayer, you invited Jesus into your heart, and so on. And uh, there was one situation where I had where I had a friend that uh, he was a drug addict, and it was a really unfortunate situation. His, his mom was on drugs and so on, had no job. And I remember one time I was in their home and I was I was took this uh, took this friend to youth service and before I did I came to pick him up and I was talking with the mom and he, she was asking me about church and I asked her I'm like well um, do you go to church she's like no I don't go to church but I'm saved I'm like well what do you mean you're saved I'm saved because I was in a Pentecostal church I said this prayer I accepted Jesus into my heart and I'm saved and here you have this woman that's completely deceived that's on drugs, that's living an adulterous lifestyle, that's completely, I mean, you can just look at her, you can tell this person maybe only has maybe five years left to live if they don't overdose before then, and this person is deceived thinking they're going to be saved. Um, another thing that I really question, especially in our churches, and friends, don't quote me on this, but a lot of times I question altar calls. I, I really do. Uh, I believe that the Holy Spirit moves. I, I believe that sometimes you have a pastor or a preacher or evangelist and he's preaching, he's saying... You know, and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is present. He makes an altar call who wants to come up, give your life to Jesus, and so on. And that can be a breaking moment for people. I, I believe in that. I believe that the Holy Spirit does move. I believe that God does work through altar calls. But a lot of times I question them. And I question them for this reason. Because when all these people, when all these followers, these multitudes came to Jesus, and they're like, we want to follow you, Jesus is like, hold on a second. Are you really sure you want to do that? And then he starts challenging them. He starts asking me, tell, tells them, are you ready to love me about, above everything else? Are you ready that, you know, to make me number one in your life that I would be superior? Are you ready to be devoted to me unto death? He's saying, are you ready uh, you know, to just pay the price for being a Christian, to make these sacrifices? I want you to sit down and count the cost to see if you're ready to do this. I don't know if you ever saw a building that wasn't finished, but sometimes it happens where a builder wants to build some kind of tower or building. He starts building, and halfway through, he can't finish it. He doesn't have enough money. And people, they mock. They laugh. They're like, oh, look at this. It was supposed to be a mall, but it didn't work. The guy didn't have enough money. The organization, the city didn't have enough money. It's embarrassing. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ is saying. He's saying there are Christians that will run up to an altar call. There are Christians that have said, I accepted Jesus by saying the sinner's prayer. And there are Christians that will say, you know, I want to follow Christ, but they didn't count the cost. They didn't, uh, they didn't look into the Bible. They didn't look into what the Bible demands and say, you know, I'm ready to sacrifice. I'm ready to leave my old life behind. I'm ready to live according to biblical principles and so on. You know, there's also a big lie in the evangelical church, and uh, a lot of us have heard this before. I've heard it before, even on Christian radio, where the preacher will be preaching. He's saying, if you give your life to Jesus, all your problems will be taken away, and your life will be perfect and good. Friends, that is a complete lie. Friends, that is a complete lie. Christianity is not easy. 
Christianity is not easy, friends. You have to fight against the flesh, as Peter was preaching. You have to fight against the world, which is all around you. It's negatively influenced by Satan, all the demonic forces. You have to fight against just everything that's around you, and you're vastly outnumbered. Christianity is not easy. There's a lot of discipline in Christianity. There's a lot of sacrifice in Christianity. There's a lot of repenting, cleansing, sacrificing, uh, sanctifying yourself when you're a Christian. And what Jesus was saying with this analogy of this foolish builder, he's saying essentially to these crowds, he's like, before you make this decision to follow me, he's like, stop, stop, stop. I want you to sit down, and I want you to count the cost. I want you to look in what I teach. I want you to look into what I say. I want you to dwell upon my words and make a decision. Are you ready to make these sacrifices? Are you ready to follow me? Are you ready to be the, the Christian that I call you to be? Uh, biblical faith is very demanding, friends, and it is not easy. It is not easy. It's something that I struggle with. It's something that you guys struggle with. It's something that we struggle with because we have a mortal, corruptible body. And uh, thank God that through Jesus Christ we have victory as Peter was preaching. And one problem that I see in our generation is that we as a generation, uh, there's no cost to Christianity for us. I mean, think about it. Christianity doesn't cost us anything. I mean, for these Jews to become a Christian, you could be rejected from your family. You can be excommunicated from the temple. Uh, you can become you know, a martyr. They would kill you for the name of Jesus because you're rebelling against the country and so on. Uh, even for our parents, they had some kind of persecution. And you know, for them to be Christian meant you know, they had limited educational opportunities. Many of our parents weren't able to go to universities because of their faith. Many of our parents would be uh, fined uh, for going to church. Some went to jail because they were pastors or preachers. Uh, a lot of times, pe you know, people, they suffered. A lot of times people, you know, it was, it's snowing and they're living in a village and they have no car and they would, you know, put their boots on and walk four or five miles to get to church in the snow. I mean, they pay the price for being a Christian. They, they sacrifice for being a Christian. Now, you know, we all live closer. If we don't, we have SUVs, we have cars, we have air conditioning, and it's hard to gather people. It's hard to gather people. Today, more than anything, I think for us, Christianity doesn't cost us enough, friends. We, we don't sacrifice enough for God. We don't give ourselves unto God like we should, as the Bible calls us to. And I want to bring up three very practical examples of how God taught me in my life that uh, being a Christian, you have, to, you have to pay the price. You have to pay the price, and sometimes it could be costly. And they're very little, small examples, but God taught me this at a young age. I remember we had a youth choir trip with our choir to Tennessee, and um, um, I had a test that basically that Monday um, when we would come back from the trip, uh, anatomy, physiology, and this is a subject where you really got to study your flashcards and so on to you know, to, to be able to, to know the answers to the test. And uh, our youth leader, Roman, asked me, he's like, Ruslan, can you preach in Tennessee? And I was, between the decision, I'm like, God, I, I really want to preach, but I, you know, I have this test and I have to study. And I made a decision. I'm like, you know what, God, that, that, that's it. I, I'll put my books to the side. I'm going to prepare a sermon. I'm going to go to Tennessee. I'm going to be a blessing. And I know and I believe that when I come back, you're going to bless me and everything's going to be okay. And I remember we went to Tennessee. I was preparing the entire week. I barely opened my anatomy textbook because, I mean, I put a lot of time into this. Went to Tennessee. We preached. And I remember when we were driving home, I attempted studying on the bus with flashcards. But for those of you that went on youth trips, you know that that's completely pointless and you can't ever really study on a bus with 15 people uh, when people are playing Uno and yelling and screaming and doing all these things. So I remember I came home and I went to bed and I got up in the morning and I was so enthusiastic and excited and like, you know, I spent an entire week sacrificing for Jesus and I'm going to do good on this test. And I remember taking this test, <laughs> it's completely bombed it. I mean, it, like a 50% or something. I mean, and I was waiting for a curve and this curve never came. And for a moment there, I was kind of like, God, like this isn't fair. I mean, you're entitled to bless me. I, I sacrificed for you. I gave this time for you instead of studying, instead of caring about my grades. You're, you're entitled to bless me. You're entire, entitled to give me a good grade. And at that moment, I realized, no, he's not. He's not entitled. Jesus Christ isn't entitled to give us anything. And a lot of times in Christianity, friends, we got to pay the price. Jesus said, count the cost. A lot of times in Christianity, you have to make these sacrifices, whether it's your grade or something else, uh, for Jesus, for a program, for a youth program, for some kind of trip. You have to pay the price. Uh, another example was, I remember I was in high school, and I didn't have a lot of American friends. Uh, maybe I had only one or two American friends. And I remember 
uh, we had a lot of Ukrainians and we would always gather. We had like a Ukrainian table, you'd have the football table, cheerleader table, cool table, and then there was us, just Yukis, you know, sitting together, Baptists, Catholics, you know, all of us together. And we would sit there together in this table of about 10 people or so. And there was one American that started hanging out with us. To be honest, I don't know why. I don't even know why he came. He didn't fit in. He couldn't understand us. Um, we would talk in Ukrainian, so he wouldn't understand us and so on. But that's beside the point. Um, I don't know what happened. I don't even know how it happened. But he became our friend. Uh, he became my friend. He became my cousin's friend. Um, we would go up after we eat lunch at the library and play, like, you know, Tetris or some race card games. We would walk home together. We would do things together. We had a senior lounge in our... Um, ping pong table in our senior lounge and we played ping pong with him and so on and and we were just good like I mean we became we became friends and I remember I, I, I would walk home with him and then you know he would split to the left I would split to the right after school and I remember one time I had this uh, thought from God and I'm like this God told me just witness to him tell him about you and I'm like great so I'm walking home and I'm like hey Aaron I want to tell you about Jesus and I for those two minutes or so when we were walking or five minutes I told him about Christ and kind of nodded his head, said, okay, and we split our ways. He went to the left, to the right. I thought everything was being okay. The next day I noticed he wasn't sitting at our table. I'm like, huh, that's weird. And a couple days went by, and I noticed he's not around us. He's not in the senior lounge with us playing ping pong. He's not um, hanging around with us. He's not walking home with me anymore. I don't know if his mom's picking him up or what's going on. And I remember this probably about a week went by, and I was in the senior lounge playing ping pong against an Indian guy who was, a, who was a, he believed in Islam, in, in Al and Islam, but he was in my medical class, and I was playing ping pong against him, and I remember, I don't know how this happened, but a big crowd of people gathered, and while we're playing ping pong, people are like rooting and cheering, and, and I started noticing some really weird, uh, you know, like, so uh, really weird, like, shouts from the crowd. And I would hear, like, it's Jesus versus Allah, Jesus versus Allah. And I was like, what is going on? We're just playing ping pong. And I ended up winning the game. And, you know, Aaron's there shouting, you know, laughing, clapping, all these other people. And he's like, Jesus won. Jesus beat Allah. Jesus beat Allah. And I was really confused. I'm like, I don't really know what's happening. I was walking home with or walking to medical class with that Indian guy. And I'm like, you know what, don't, you know, don't think about what they're saying. They're, you know, they're just being jerks. Don't, you know, don't take it to heart and so on. And he's like, Russ, you know, I don't, but you don't know that when you weren't there yesterday in the senior lounge, they were making fun of you. And he says, the person that was making fun of you the most was Aaron, your friend. And if, at that point, I kind of felt, I felt betrayed. But at the same time, again, I was like, God, how can you do this? I mean, this is my friend, one of my only American friends that I ever had in high school. And I had an opportunity to tell him about Jesus. I did. And now, and now here he is making fun of me and... I'm like, God, how can you do this? And friends, uh, we live in this society, in this Christian society where, in America where we believe in the prosperity gospel. We believe in this kind of idea, this kind of thought that Jesus Christ is entitled to give us something. If we serve him, if we witness, if we do something for him, he is entitled to give us something back because we did something for him. Friends, I want us to stop thinking like that. Jesus Christ isn't entitled to give us anything at all. He already gave everything he had. He gave himself on the cross. He's not entitled to give us anything. And a lot of times in life, when we do things for him, we have to pay the price. I mean, these are very small and simple examples, but we have to pay the price. Very last example, I had a, a best friend when I was growing up. Uh, he was down the street. Uh, he moved from Ukraine. We became friends, and we would, I mean, play basketball. We would uh, hang out all the time. We would go to school, uh, just go to Applebee's after youth service and so on. And, I mean, we'd go ice skating together and everything. And, I mean, he was my best friend. I mean, his name was Ruslan, too. We, you know, we got along together and stuff. And, and time went by, and I started noticing that, you know, he's really drifting the wrong way. And at that moment, I thank God that God, he touched my heart, and he saved me uh, through a period when I was just reading Scripture, and I was born again. And I remember that I started noticing that he's drifting the wrong way, and he's just hanging around the wrong crowd and so on. This was about high school age. And there was one time where I just had to tell him. I just met up with him, and I told him, I'm like, listen, I, I can't be friends with you if you're going to keep going this way. I had to tell him. I'm like, I, I'm a brand-new believer. Um, you're starting to neg negatively influence me, and I want to be your friend. You're my best friend, but I can't be friends with you if you're pulling me in that direction. Either, you know, you become a Christian, or, or we can't be friends anymore. And I remember that's how we basically parted. And time went by, not a lot of time. Uh, you know, he was arrested for trying to rob a store. Uh, later, you know, he was caught, overdosed, and so on. Uh, now I think he's deported somewhere somewhere in Ukraine. 
And I just, it's very difficult to make these decisions when you're a Christian. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be friends with people who, who aren't devout followers of Christ or so on. But what I'm saying, friends, is sometimes you got to pay the price to be a Christian. These are very simple and small examples of paying a price to be a Christian, of sacrificing to be a Christian. Uh, you know, these Jews, in the time of Jesus, they had to give so much more. But, friends, I believe as we as Christians, we have to learn to uh, count the costs and just, you know, make these decisions and sacrifice for Christ. Uh, and there's times where we have to sacrifice a grade. There's times where we have to sacrifice friends, uh, popularity. Maybe it's a job because it doesn't honor Christ. Maybe it's a position. Uh, maybe it's an opportunity to work somewhere or go to college. Maybe it's some kind of freedom or even money. But we have to make these decisions to sacrifice for Christ. Now, uh, jumping back to the text, uh, let's jump back into verse 31 and look at the second analogy that Jesus brings. He says, Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet those who come to him with 20,000? Here Jesus gives this analogy of a king that's getting ready for battle. And he's saying if there's a king that has 10,000 soldiers and he wants to fight a king that has 20,000 soldiers, he's going to sit down and he's going to think about it. He's going to try to come up with a plan. He's going to try to you know, look at from it from different views, from different points and say, am I able to truly win? Am I able to somehow maybe ambush him or to take over and what Jesus is doing is he's comparing this to the Christian life, and he's saying, I'm urging you, I'm urging you to uh, think before pledging allegiance to me. He's saying, I'm urging you to do this. I don't just want you to say, I believe in Jesus, I want to follow you. He's saying, no, I want you to sit down. I really want you to think. I really want you to make a decision. Are you willing to pay the price to be a Christian? Are you willing to do what I call you to do? And friends, as we know, Christianity was always a minority. Uh, Christians were always vastly outnumbered. Um, you know, Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples in one passage, he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Sheep, they're helpless. They can't defend themselves. And wolves, these are these, you know, dangerous animals that just destroy sheep. And Jesus says, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. He's saying you're going to be outnumbered. He's saying it's not easy out there. Uh, you know, to be a disciple... In our age, it means to go against the culture. It means to go against the worldview. I mean, it's not easy today to say, I disagree with homosexuality, because when you do, even Christians will tell you you're a homophobe. It's not easy today to say, I believe in marriage and I don't believe in divorce, because people will say, that's just a part of our culture. How, how do you not believe in divorce? Stop judging. You're so judgmental. It's, it's so easy to just fit in with everyone else, friends. It's so easy for us to just fit in with everyone else and just kind of like, just be like the crowd, just be like the multitudes. But that's exactly what Jesus didn't want. That's exactly what Jesus was preaching to these multitudes. He's like, I don't care about the multitudes. I don't care about the crowd. I care about individual followers. I care about disciples. And uh, being a disciple is standing for God's truth when no one else does. And uh, verse 33, we're coming to a close now. He says, so likewise... Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. What Jesus is saying is he's saying, if you live for anything else or if you live for anyone else apart from me, he's saying, I don't want you as my disciple. I mean, friends, think about that. These are some high demands that Jesus is giving his disciples. These crowds that want to follow him and want to you know, add on to these 12 disciples, they're, they're like, Jesus, want to follow me? He's like, hold on a second. Are you really sure you want to do this? you got to really pay the price. you got to think about it. you got to consider if you truly want to do this because Christianity can cost you your life. Christianity has a big price tag, and are you willing to pay that price? And he says, if you're not willing to forsake everything that you have, meaning if you're not willing to live for Christ, if you live for anyone or anything apart from Christ, he says, you cannot be my disciple. He says, you can't. You know, Peter was preaching about how to overcome sin, and he said, we're overcome, we overcome sin by Christ. And friends, very practically, if you just break that down, you overcome sin when you're a disciple. You, you start overcoming sin. You start having a victorious life in Christ when you're a disciple. When you don't live like everyone else, when you don't think like everyone else, when you don't have the same views as everyone else, when you look at this passage and other passages of Scripture and you're challenged and you're motivated and inspired by Jesus' claims to his followers. You know, Jesus wasn't interested in making converts. A lot of times that's all we're interested in. We just want more people to come and repent and more people, more people. We as people, we just want crowds and multitudes. He, he, Jesus didn't want crowds. He wanted followers. He wanted disciples. 
We as Christians, we should work upon this to try to become a disciple. And when we become a disciple, when we do what the gospel calls us to do, when we're challenged and we step up to this challenge, that's when we can be victorious. Friends, and I see this in my life. When I'm devoted to God, I have victory. When I'm not, I don't. When I'm sanctified to God, I have victory. When I'm not, I don't. When I just love God with all of my heart, I see how everything blossoms spiritually. When I'm not, I don't. It just goes downhill. God wants disciples. He doesn't just want converts. And you have people today that you know, believe in God, but they're, they want to live the American dream. Or you have people that they believe in God, but they want to be rich. They believe in God, but they're pursuing some kind of career, and their entire life is about their career. You have people that say they believe in God, but their entire life is just revolved around fun and entertainment. Friends, there's a time and place for everything. Uh, We need fun. You guys had fun today at the volleyball courts or wherever you went. And praise God for that. The Bible says everything that we should do, we should do in the name of the Lord. There's nothing wrong with fun. But sometimes I see for youth, it's just like this idol. People are just all about fun, fun, entertainment, entertainment. And Jesus Christ is saying, if you don't forsake everything that you have, if you don't forsake all these different ideas and plans and motives for your life, he says, you can't be my disciple. You're not going to make it. It's hard being a follower of Jesus Christ. You have to pay the price. It's not easy being a follower of Christ. Uh, one passage that really sticks out in my mind when Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians, he was talking about all his credentials that he had as a Jew, about everything he accomplished. Then he comes to this passage where he says, and everything I had that I counted as gain, he says, I count it as trash. He says, I count it as rubbish for the excellence of knowing God. Apostle Paul, he came to this time in his life to this breaking point when he realized that to live for anything else, to live for anyone else is pointless. I mean, everything you can have, your bank account, your career, whatever you might be in this world, it's all like trash and rubbish compared to knowing Jesus Christ. And this is what God calls us to do in closing with verse 34. It says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its flavor, if salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land or for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has an ear, let him hear. Uh, We know that salt is a product that is good for many things. It's good in the kitchen. It's good for snow, for ice, and so on. It's good as seasoning. Uh, It prevents meat from breaking down and so on. Uh, It has many many good properties. And Jesus said that we are the salt of the earth. Um, But when salt, it loses its flavor. When it loses its properties, it's, it's... it's not even do any good to just a pile of manure. I mean, manure, it's at least good for land. It's good for fertilizer. You can put it on your farm, your parents, if they have a farm or some kind of garden. It's going to help everything grow. But if you throw the salt onto this manure, you're ruining the manure. That's, that's how bad this worthless salt is. And Jesus Christ is saying that a Christian who doesn't sacrifice anything, a Christian who doesn't pay the price, a Christian who has no dedications or devotions to God is like this flavorless salt. A Christian like this is useless, useless. He's worthless. He can't do anything for the kingdom of God. He's just worthless. And friends, when I read this passage, I don't know about you, but this fear just came over me, and I started thinking to myself, I'm like, God, I don't want to be like the salt. You know, I don't want to be a Christian that just, you know, named a Christian or called a Christian. I don't... I don't want to be just this person that's completely useless. I come to church, I do my religious duties, but I'm completely useless and worthless, and I have no impact on this world. I have no impact on other believers. I have no impact for the kingdom of God. What a sad situation. And for us to prevent this, Jesus Christ, he, he told the crowds what to do. Uh, go home and read this passage. Uh, cha- you know, if you don't agree with something I said, that's great. I mean, that's awesome. I love when people don't agree with me because they go and they, they search the scriptures and they look for themselves. Uh, Luke chapter 14. Look at this passage. It's nine verses from verse 25 to 34. Study this passage. Friends, it's a powerful passage. It's a passage that challenges me every time I read it, every time I think about it, to really uh, to be a better Christian, to be more devoted, to, to live for him and to follow him wholeheartedly. Uh, let's end up on our feet right now. We're going to continue our service, but... Uh, Let's just say a prayer right now. Let's just spend some time just thinking about this message, about what it means to be a disciple, and may God bless us all.
My sermon is going to be about, it's, it's a really big topic, so I won't be able to go into detail, but the topic is, what is the meaning of life? And this can have so many different themes inside of it, and I would like you to uh, pray for me as I preach, so God can speak to your heart. Because I cannot say with my own words what God wants to say to you through the Holy Spirit. And if you have the desire to uh, pray for me, please do. And uh, I want to pretty much, it goes along with the other sermons that were spoken. uh, That we need to not focus on this earthly life. Do not live for our flesh. Resist sin and live for God. And that we need to be ready to carry our cross. We need to be ready to ready for persecutions if they have to happen in the future. Because we don't know what's going to be tomorrow. We'll, because we are not in control. We do not have the power to say, tomorrow I will be well. Tomorrow I will be in health. Tomorrow I will be alive. And it's very important if we're in this situation that tomorrow something bad can happen. Tomorrow I can either get a sickness that I cannot be healed, or tomorrow I can get in a, let's say, some kind of a dilemma, and then I pass away from this life. Where would I be? The most important question is, where would I be in eternity? And today is the time to get ready. As Paul says, today is the day of salvation. And it's important for us to realize that we are living for today. We're not living for tomorrow. We're living for God right now in reality. We're not going to be saying, tomorrow I'll repent. Tomorrow I'll do that. Tomorrow I will serve God with all my heart. But today I want to serve a little bit for myself. And that is something that I try to uh, analyze my heart. Am I, is my heart fully following God? And sadly, many times I can notice that, no, that's, that's not the case. I, I notice... Uh, I did a flaw over there. Uh, I had a thought that was not completely holy over there. And, uh, and sometimes people even point out, hey, you didn't do this right. And those are the moments when we as humans need to understand that we're sinful people. And we need to understand that we need to accept those criticisms and say, that is true. A- accept. Do not deny the truth. But except, yes, I'm flawed in this, in this fear in my life. Uh, and I need the Holy Spirit to help me, to change me, so I can bear the righteous fruits toward God, that I can serve Him the right way. And um, a passage that came to mind as I was thinking about this was Matthew 25. I will not read it, but it talks about the ten virgins, the, the one, five that were wise and five that were foolish and each of them were uh, given a time to prepare but when the bridegroom came there was five that were ready and five that were not ready and at the very last verse 25 13 Jesus says so you too must keep watch for you do not know the day or hour of my return that was the main theme of this parable that Jesus gave the main theme it was not try to decide what was the oil or who were the virgins but the main theme was keep watch be ready be ready for his return and um, we need to remember that our our desire our um, life here on earth is to please God it is always to do his will Examples um, of what Jesus wants us to do is um, written clearly in Scripture. It is not only to believe the Scripture. It is not only to acknowledge it and accept it and just read the Bible and that's it and that's where it stops. But it needs to be in action. It needs to be following. Jesus wants us to follow him, not to just believe in him. For even uh, we see uh, Jesus' ministry on this earth. 
he, he came to the disciples. He taught them. But also, we read about how he sends them out. How he sends them to heal the sick, to cast out uh, demons, and to preach the gospel to the poor. He tells them that what I taught you, you share with them. And how important it is for us to always be ready to share the gospel whenever we have the opportunity. If we see an opportunity to share Christ, that is what we have to do. We cannot say, it's going to be uncomfortable to me, as the brother was speaking, that we have to bear our, our own cross. That our lives will be the way Jesus taught. And um, that is a brief summary and, uh, of what I was going to preach about. And we must remember that I want to uh, read a passage. It is something that God has revealed to me as I was reading. Uh, I read this passage many times, and I didn't really pay attention to it. But when I understood what, what it means to know God, it helped me understand a, a bigger reality of God. Uh, we read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. It's talking about Jesus. So 1 John 2, 2. He himself is a sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the, all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If somebody claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and it is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That, that is how we know that we are living in him. Those who say that they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. So we see, the, when I read this verse, I, uh, the words that came out to me, to know God, you need to obey his commandments. To know God, you should live as Jesus did, as Jesus lived. And also Jesus reminds us uh, that as he was uh, preaching on this earth, he was saying that if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And that is something that is something that we must remember. We must not just confess God with our mouth, but we must obey his commandments. So we have this intimate relationship with him. So it's not going to be just in, in uh, let's say, theology. Like we understand, we understand who God is. We understand this and this, but that we know what God wants us to do and to do, uh, live, it, live our lives as Christ would want us to live. And I would like us to come before God in prayer that we can analyze our hearts as we pray to see, do I really follow God? Do I really strive to serve Him? Do I really try to be this Christian that when Christ looks at me, He would say, I am pleased with what you do. That is something that we need to strive for because our home is not here on earth. Although it might seem like it, although we might, for us, it seems like reality is here on earth. But when we really think about it, if we really think about it and believe what the scripture says, this life is so short compared to eternity. We need to realize that our life our life shapes our eternity for us. Our life here, for maybe 70, 80 years, 90 years, just these small years, they shape our eternity, which lasts forever. And if we pull our mind in that perspective, we realize what the scripture says is true in reality. What the brother Peter was preaching, that we must Abhor sin, to stay away from it. Why? Because it leads us to destruction, to eternal damnation, away from God, away from Christ. And we realize that this small sacrifice here on earth means so little compared to the eternal glory that we will be with Christ.
that we might live eternally with Christ, that we might live, maybe even if our whole life here on earth was in misery and suffering, but it was for Christ's sakes, it's worth it. And let us analyze as we pray before God that we might see ourselves as we are and be completely honest with ourselves. How do I serve God? Let us pray.